up with me, Susan Madaris. We are coming to you from New York City. And my guest this week is Dr. Alan Sobrowski. He's joining me via satellite from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Join us. Alan Sobrowski is a writer and consultant specializing in national and international security affairs. In December 1988, he received the Superior Civilian Service Award after more than five years of service at the U.S. Army War College as Director of Studies, Strategic Studies Institute, and holder of the General of the Army Douglas MacArthur Chair of Research. A Marine Corps Vietnam veteran and a 1986 graduate of the U.S. Army War College, Dr. Sobrowski's teaching and research appointments have included the U.S. Military Academy and the Center for Strategic and International Studies. While in government service, he held concurrent adjunct professorships at Georgetown University and the Johns Hopkins University of Advanced International Studies. His published work includes 13 books or monographs and over 160 articles, chapters, and book reviews. He is currently completing a book-length study on the U.S. use of military force as an instrument of foreign policy titled Presidential War, the Politics of Military Intervention. Dr. Sobrowski is also an editor at Veterans Today, where his latest series of articles regarding Israeli involvement in the 9-11 attacks against the United States is a shocking expose of how the Israeli Mossad planned the attacks and how the U.S. military had prior knowledge. An argument often not discussed, especially by someone like Alan Sobrowski, who is an American of Jewish ancestry. However, Sobrowski bravely addresses this sensitive and controversial topic as someone devoted to the security of the United States at any cost. So what happens when a military insider puts the devastating terror attacks of 9-11 directly at Israel's doorstep? Dr. Alan Sobrowski, thank you so much for joining us on The Autograph. My pleasure, Susan. Tell us how you make the case for Israel's involvement in the tragic 9-11 attacks. There were several different ways of doing it, Susan, and uh, this may be a little bit more background than some of your, your people need, but I began to have suspicions about what had happened on 9-11 about two weeks after the attacks. There were several discontinuities that made no sense to me whatsoever. Uh, the, the behavior on the part of some of the named terrorists, uh, these 19 Arabs on four planes, running around flying schools like loose cannon, not having the pilot skills to fly the aircraft, no recognition for what they had done afterwards in their own area, their own community. And it struck me that, that for many reasons, none of the arguments that were being given for what they did made any sense. But I then immediately forgot about it until about two years ago. And then I came across a, a video which I found to be extremely disturbing. That video was an interview with a Dutch demolitions expert named Danny Joenko. Uh, and it concerned the collapse of the third World Trade Center tower to go down on September 11th. This was the 47th story. World Trade Center 7, the third tallest building at the World Trade Center. Joenko had never heard of it, neither had I. And when you looked at the building, you saw that there was effectively no damage to any face of the building. It had not been hit by a plane. It had not been taken major trauma from debris. And it went straight down into its own footprint in about seven seconds in what was visibly a controlled demolition. You know, and it was pretty clear that whatever those 19 named Arabs on four planes, two of them at the World Trade Center, had or had not done, they could not have had any possible effect on that third building going down. Shortly after that, I came across, partly out of my own curiosity, uh, which this, this definitely aroused, and a very extensive video, uh, both of which I've cited, by the way, in, in some of my recent articles, which were taken on 9-11 itself from what became Ground Zero, the base of World Trade Center 1 and 2, the Twin Towers, uh, involving police, emergency services personnel, 
newspaper and television correspondents, and you can see and hear secondary explosions at the base of the World Trade Center buildings. Now, planes impacting at 800 to 1,000 feet above the ground are not going to cause secondary explosions at the ground floor. And this followed over into other reports, also there on September 11th, about vans in the area, white vans. In one case, a van was picked up by, and by police and people arrested at the access to a major bridge. The van was filled with explosives and the two people in it were Israelis. In Bergen, New Jersey, same day, a van with several people in it had set up cameras before the first plane hit they were filming the Twin Towers and they were celebrating. High fives, it was, a, it was a good thing for them. Residents called police, police arrested them, all five were Israelis. What intrigued me, in addition to, to angering me, was that within days, all of these reports disappeared from the media. Most Americans don't know that a third building went down at the World Trade Center. Most have never heard about the secondary explosions reported by CNN, ABC, Fox, and others at the, ground, at the foundation of World Trade Center 1 and 2. None have ever heard about the vans. So I began looking at this very carefully, and one of the things that I, I began looking at was just what would it have taken for a special operations group of any particular nationality to have done 9-11, either by having taken control of the, the operation we have been told about, of the 19 named Arabs on four planes, or having run a parallel operation where you have four planes being hijacked but there is another operation being done with those in concert. And I picked up three particular factors that would need to be taken into account. One was motivation, a second was expertise, and the third, the critical one, was access. Now, when it came to motivation, uh, it's probably a very sad commentary on where we are in the world today, that there are an awful lot of countries and groups out there in the world that have either real or contrived reasons to hate America. Uh, it wasn't that way when I was a young man, but then many things weren't the same way now as they were when I was a young man. But all the, almost all of the groups and countries that might want to do this only had a negative reason for doing it. They wanted to hurt us. The Israelis had a positive reason, and it's one that a number of their their supporters had talked about from the 1990s on up and uh, what was called the Project for a New American Century, whose members included, by the way, by later Vice President Richard Cheney, later Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and many of the so-called neoconservatives, most of them Jewish but not all, um, who came into the first Bush administration. Israel had a positive reason, and it was get the United States involved in a war in the Middle East with a powerful, enraged, anti-Islamic strain within the American public, that they needed a catalytic event to produce this. They even talked about it in terms of another Pearl Harbor is needed to bring the American people into this fight. The second was expertise, lots of expertise out there. Bringing buildings down and controlled demolitions is something that almost any intelligence agency of any country in the world can do or can contract. There are many private agencies that do this. But one thing is absolutely clear. Neither those 19 named Arabs on the plane nor Al-Qaeda as an organization had the expertise, the technical expertise to do that. And there is one very clear proof of that. If Al-Qaeda and its affiliates had had the ability to wire even one building for a controlled demolition at the World Trade Center, much less all three of them, 
the so-called green zone in the heart of Baghdad would have been a pile of rubble. And it wasn't. But the last is access. The World Trade Center security was an Israeli-owned company. Security at all three of the airports from which the four aircraft on 9-11 departed, ICTS, was an Israeli security company. That security company, by the way, also had security at the airports in Paris and Amsterdam later, from which the so-called shoe and underwear bombers departed. The security company at the World Trade Center had 24-7 state-of-the-art electronic surveillance and foot patrols. Wiring a building for a controlled demolition, and I must, I must confess here, this is not my specialty. I have, I have heard what people who do this for a living have said about it, but it is not my specialty. But the description of it and the video of Danny Jawenko that I mentioned to you is a very good one on this. And he described it in which if you needed to do it in a few hours, you would need 30 to 40 people, fewer if you had more time, cutting open the walls, cutting, literally cutting open the walls all the way around the building, implanting the explosives, running detonator cord and cable, wires to put them to a control system, coordinating all of this activity. This is not something that involves the casual bringing in of a briefcase and leaving it at the foot of a building's elevator and going out again. This is extensive, extensive work, and it would require the type of extensive sustained access that could not go unremarked by the security forces in place on this. They also needed the ability to evade an a apprehension and to have their escape concealed. And they had that done. All of the Israelis who were apprehended in those vans were later released in about two months at the direction of Michael Cherkov, then the second director of Homeland Security, a dual U.S. Israeli national. There is no mention of them in the mainstream media, which is largely Zionist owned. All of the major networks, all of the major national newspapers, all three of the weekly news magazines, all of the major political journals, most of the major publishing houses. It simply didn't happen. The only thing that happened on 9-11 that was discussed in the media, that had been accepted by the government, that was described in the 9-11 Commission are 19 named Arabs on four planes bringing down two buildings. And the rest of it, in Orwellian terms, has become a non-event and a non-story. And you know, since you just pointed to the 9-11 Commission report, there is an understanding that the primary motivation for 9-11 was U.S. support for Israel's brutal oppression of the Palestinians, also conveyed in the 9-11 Commission report. I guess my question is, how are these two incidents, or theories, so to say, related? And, you know, there are those that will brush off your argument as a conspiracy theory. Are you concerned? I don't, I don't think that's so much of a conspiracy theory. Um, I, I, was, I was smiling when you said that because uh, to tell, us, tell a bit of a story on this, back in the early 80s when I was in Washington at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, one of our, one of our visitors for a luncheon talk was a young gentleman then named Francois Heisberg. Heisberg was the special assistant to French President Francois Mitterrand. And I don't know how the subject came up, but he said, you know, Americans never see conspiracies anywhere. We French, he said, we see conspiracies everywhere. And both of us are wrong. This is not a conspiracy in, in, in the sense that it is usually used, the word is usually used, which is to denigrate an opposing argument. When someone in the United States says that that's a conspiracy or that's a conspiracy theory, by definition, they mean it is irrational, illegitimate, and without proof. 
All I would suggest to people is that you look at the films of WTC7, that third tower going down on September 11th. You look and listen to the reports on September 11th with the secondary explosions. These are not fantasies. They happened. You look at the reports on September 12th of the apprehension of Israelis with vans of explosives and cameras filming the events on September 11. These are not fantasies. And you look at the people riddling the American government, all of the Middle East people in State Defense and the National Security Council, Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy Douglas Fife, who used to be a friend of mine, by the way, from Philadelphia. These people were all part of the neoconservative movement. Many of these people are dual U.S. Israeli nationals. All of their primary allegiance is to Israel. In a recent article, Sobrowski explains why he is anti-Israeli. He notes, because of what it has done to the U.S. in the furtherance of its own goals. The USS Liberty incident and 9-11 obviously stand out. And because of the leverage it has acquired over the U.S. government and its policies through the machinations of the domestic Jewish community here. My concern is that I don't much care about I don't much care about other people or other countries. Uh, I don't hate anyone in particular. Uh, I don't like anyone in particular. I'm an American. My loyalty is strictly to the United States. And I don't care what my ethnicity is or what my ancestry is. My allegiance is that. And my concern is only whether something helps or hurts the United States. And I think anyone who's a citizen of any country can very properly have similar feelings toward their country. What I'm concerned about is what is done to hurt America. And it is very clear that over a period of the last 40 odd years that the penetration of the American political process, the effective subordination of the Congress in particular to Israel, when an when a Israeli prime minister can get 29 standing ovations from a Congress that can't give that much support to one of their own presidents, no matter how outlandish the statements, you have something as close to a puppet agency as you're going to find. Our policy in the Middle East has for decades been manipulated increasingly in terms of what benefits Israel and not what benefits the United States. Even when that policy is articulated and supported by individuals who are sworn officials of the United States government. And to me, when a sworn official of the United States government, whether or not that person has dual Israeli citizenship, manipulates American policy, contrives crises and, and tragedies like 9-11, contrives wars like Afghanistan and Iraq, and try, now tries to get us into a war with Iran, all in the service of Israel, spending American lives in that process, they commit high treason, and they need to be treated in that manner. In his article, Zionism Unmasked, the Dark Face of Jewish Nationalism, Sobrowski looks at the differences between Jewish nationalism, or Zionism, and that of other countries and cultures. He argues that, first of all, Zionism is a real witch's brew of xenophobia, racism, ultra-nationalism and militarism that places it way outside of a mere nationalist context. Secondly, Zionism undermines civic loyalty. Thirdly, the enemy of normal nationalist movement is the occupying power and perhaps its allies. And once independence is achieved, normal relations with the occupying power are truly the norm. But for Zionism, almost everyone out there is an actual or potential enemy. I continue our interview by asking him about his theory. Well, you know, I, I think the first thing to note, and I, I want to be sure that this is emphasized, is that 
is that Jewish nationalism or Zionism is not Judaism. It has nothing to do with Judaism. Uh, much, many of the Zionists are, are very secular Jews. They are, they are not practicing Jews in a religious sense. The thing that's intriguing about, about Zionism and I, th I think I use the phrase that it's a real witch's brew of, of xenophobia, ultranationalism, and militarism uh, with, a, with a nice scrap of, of regional imperialism built into it. Most, most nationalism is like, not like that. Most nationalism is intended to be a unifying force, but it doesn't go to such an extreme level. A second element of it is that when you have competing nationalisms, it, it's very, very rare to find anything that, that involves the level of antipathy and hatred to, to the other side. Sabrowski believes that Americans should see where they stand now, what should be done, and where America must stand if it wishes to alter the world Zionism has contrived. While he paints a realistic picture of what the current situation is, he addresses why so many attempts to contain Zionism in the U.S. have failed throughout the years. You know, a good friend of the show, James Morris, who has contributed greatly not only to this show, The Autograph, but also in raising public awareness, notably on his website, AmericaHijack.com, I remember him saying that he was a registered Republican for many years, but ultimately found it very hard as an American to relate to that party, or the Democratic Party for that matter, and became extremely frustrated, notably because of the government's support for AIPAC and similar organizations and the United States support for Israel in general. Just recently he was quoted as saying that he has become an independent. But I guess my question is and my point is that are we seeing more public awareness, more frustration inside the United States among Americans because the ones that I talk to seem to be very, very upset to say the least and they seem to feel very strongly about this issue. I think many Americans are finding it difficult to relate to their government but the idea that there's any kind of a mass movement there because of the relationship to Israel is simply not the case. There, there, is, no, there is no vehicle for that type of opposition to have been uh, created. There is not even an awareness on the part of most of the American people about the details of 9-11 that I, that I mentioned to you. One of my last article uh, was, was much more of a practical, how do we get the word out? Um, and I think that if, if people did understand what had really happened at 9-11, you could very rapidly see a very substantial reorientation of public opinion. Dr. Alan Sobrowski, thank you so much for those comments. So much more to talk about. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Hopefully, we will see you back on the autograph next time here in New York City. Susan, thank you very much. I sincerely hope I too can meet you there, and I'm only sorry that, that the missed plane connections didn't make it possible last night. No worries. It was a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Susan. You take care. All the best wishes to you. That's all the time we have for this edition of The Autograph here on Press TV. Thank you for staying with us and watching. Remember, you can always send us your emails to The Autograph at SusanModaris.com. We are always looking forward to them. Until next week in another show from all of us here in New York City. Goodbye.